Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I think we will get started now. Uh, my name is Monique Shignac. I'm a scientific director and a senior scientist at the Institute for Work and Health. Welcome to our speaker series presentations. I'm delighted today to um, be able to introduce Dr. Cameron Mustard and Bashak Yanar. Before I do the introductions, however, I'm just going to go through a couple of um, housekeeping uh, bits of information for you. So the first First is uh, that we do have closed captioning available to you, um, and so you can turn that on and off, and that's at the bottom of your screen. You can find the little CC icon. Um, uh, the other uh, piece of important information is that we will be holding questions until the end of the talk, and to ask a question, we um, ask that you write it in the question and answer box. Uh, please don't use the chat. We will try to monitor that, um, but um, um, we uh, will be looking, I'll be looking at the question and answer box uh, to get your questions to the speakers, um, and then they will answer from there. Uh, I also want to, um, I guess, alert you to uh, the, the most common question that we get asked is, will the presentation be available um, to those um, who have joined uh, in terms of the slides or the actual talk itself? And yes, it will. Um, usually this takes about a week, um, and then we will post uh, the presentation on our website. Um, so let me turn now uh, to introductions so we can get started. So I'm delighted today to welcome uh, Dr. Cameron Mustard and Bashak Yunar. Uh, Dr. Mustard is the former president and senior scientist um, at the Institute for well Work and Health, and he retired in January 2022. Um, he continues his affiliation with the Institute and leads a number of active research projects. Um, Dr. Mustard completed his uh, doctoral training in epidemiology, health policy, and behavioral Sciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Hygiene and Public Health. And Cam's research interests include work environments, labor market experiences in health, the distributional equity of publicly funded health and healthcare programs in Canada, and the epidemiology of socioeconomic health inequalities. Welcome, Cam. Welcome back. Um, uh, Dr. Bashak Inar is an associate scientist at the Institute for Work and Health and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health. She holds a PhD in organizational behavior and human resources management from the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. And Bashak's uh, research interests focus on migration, work and occupational health and safety, the psychosocial work environment and ways that organizations can promote healthier and safer work. Uh, workplaces. So today they will be talking about estimating the financial benefits of OHS prevention expenditures, a study of Ontario employers. And again, if you have questions, we welcome them. Please type them into the question and answer box. And I will now turn it over to you, Cam and Bashak. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And Monique, thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, so Bashak and I are quite pleased actually to have the opportunity to share a summary of work we've recently completed. And in our presentation today, we'll provide some background to this study and question. Are there, are there potential positive financial benefits to an employer's expenditure on health and safety? We're gonna provide an overview of the methods we've used and we'll describe what we found. And as Monique said, we do look forward to engaging any questions or comments you may have following our remarks. Could you advance to the next slide, please? Uh, so just prior to the pandemic, uh, we completed work to estimate in Ontario what employers spend on occupational health and safety. And what we found in this work is that these expenditures are substantial. So for example, in the goods producing sectors, manufacturing, construction, mining, utilities, the average health and safety expenditure per worker per year was about $2,400. In the service sectors where health and safety risks are often lower, expenditures were lower in the range of about $850 per worker per year. And the scale of these expenditures for us raised the question, what's the finance potential financial return to employers from these expenditures? Or said another way, what are the potential financial benefits of strong health and safety performance? Can I have the next slide? 
So we thought we'd start with a bit of background to set the stage. Um, about 10 years ago, the International Social Security Association, which is based in Geneva, published a study of health and safety expenditures among about 300 employers in the European Union. And that work reported that the average health and safety expenditure per worker per year was in the range of about $1,800 Canadian. And on first glance, at least to me, these estimates seemed perhaps high. Would that be the same number here in Ontario? And as we looked around, we, we realized that we couldn't find comparable estimates for Ontario employers. And so to address this gap, we reached out to about 350 Ontario employers to work with us to estimate what they spent on health and safety in five dimensions. And just by the way, as we reached out to 350 Ontario employers, we focused on recruiting employers such that they were representing 18 important economic sectors from healthcare to financial services, mining, construction, agriculture. So the five dimensions were expenditures on organizational management and supervision. So this, for example, is the time in hours of the person most responsible for occupational health and safety. It also represents the time of supervisors in ensuring that the workplace is complying with organizational policies in the area of health and safety. And importantly, the time effort of members of joint health and safety committees. So that's one dimension. A second dimension was expenditures on the training of staff, both new staff and long tenured staff in occupational health and safety, expenditures on personal protective equipment, whether the firm or the employer did or did not retain external health and safety professional services, and if they did, what the value of that is. And the final dimension was we asked employers if they could give us an estimate when new capital investment was made, what share of that new capital could be attributed to improved health and safety. Go to the next slide. Okay. So here's an example from 50 employers that we spoke to in the manufacturing sector in Ontario. The average health and safety expenditure was about $1,500 per worker per year in this sector. So in a firm with 100 employees, a manufacturing firm of 100 employees, this represents an annual health and safety expenditure of about $150,000. About half of this $1,500 per worker per year, about $850, was attributed to organizational management and supervision. And by the way, about a third of this $850 was attributed to the activities of the Joint Health and Safety Committee. Staff training in health and safety, personal protective equipment represented the other major spending components. Occupational health and safety professional services and the safety share of new capital were much smaller components, but we think useful to have recorded them. And what do we mean by the safety share of new capital investment? Well, here's an example. If a manufacturing employer invested in automating a material handling process that was previously manual, we asked employers to estimate how much of the capital cost could be attributed to reducing the risk of work-related injury and illness among employees. So that's an example of what we asked employers to noodle through with us. Could I have the next slide? So here's a high-level summary of this previous study. Ontario employers on uh, health and safety expenditures are broadly similar to employer expenditures in the European Union. And this does, I think, make sense. Canada and the EU are major trading partners, and both jurisdictions have broadly similar health and safety regulatory standards. Ontario employers expenditures on health and safety are substantial from an average of about $2,400 per worker per year in the goods producing sectors to uh, $850 per worker per year in the service sectors. And just a brief side sidebar, 
we gathered this information from Ontario employers before the pandemic. And as the pandemic struck in early 2020, for those of you attending this webinar in essential service sectors, you'll absolutely agree with me that many, many employers in these sectors substantially increased their health and safety expenditures to meet the sort of heightened challenges of protecting the health of workers during an infectious disease pandemic. So if you'd like to learn more and you can read about that previous studies methods and findings by following the link here, the paper's open access, which means you just click on it and it's yours. So at this moment, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Bashak to pick up the story. Thank you, Cam. Um, our current study builds on this foundational work that Cam described. And with this study, we wanted to answer the following questions. Um, given the substantial expenditures on occupational health and safety in Ontario, is it possible to estimate the financial benefits to employers from these expenditures? And whether employers with strong occupational health and safety performance realize intangible financial benefits? And if so, what is the financial value of these intangible benefits? So while tangible financial benefits are the direct and indirect costs of lost time claims averted by an employer's strong health and safety performance, such as avoided cost of work disruption, intangible financial benefits are harder to quantify. So these are the benefits that employers with strong health and safety performance realize over time arising from improved employee retention and satisfaction, improved production quality, and strengthened corporate reputation. Could you advance to the next slide, please? Um, so previous research used a range of methods to estimate the financial benefits of occupational health and safety uh, ex expenditures. Um, the study led by the International Social Security Association that Cam described earlier, estimated the financial benefits of over 300 employers in the European Union by asking the representatives of these um, participating employers to provide their assessment of the ratio uh, of benefits to their occupational health and safety expenditures. And the study estimated 2.2 euros in financial benefits for each euro invested in prevention. Um, in another study applying a similar methodology, Huang and colleagues conducted a survey of 400 American companies where they asked the corporate financial decision makers their perceptions of direct and indirect costs of workplace injury and their estimates of the return of investment of improving workplace health and safety. And the study estimated a median of um, $2 in financial benefits of $1 invested in prevention. Um, focusing on the construction industry, a study in United Kingdom by Iqbe and colleagues collected information from 80 contractors about their estimate of how much their organizations were spending in occupational health and safety as well as the total benefits accrued to their organizations as a result of their actions taken to prevent accidents. So the, the study estimated also intangible benefits um, such as corporate image improvement and savings on hiring costs. And this study estimated $3 pound sterling in financial benefits for each pound invested in prevention. Can I have the next slide? So with the same aim of estimating the financial return on health and safety investments, we have applied an alternate method for estimating the financial benefits, distinguishing between financial benefits that are tangible and those that are intangible. So Cam will walk you through our methods, but let's take a quick look at what we found. The employers we consulted with in our study agreed that in addition to the tangible benefits, the intangible financial benefits of their health and safety investments um, attributed to improved employee morale and satisfaction, production quality, and strengthened corporate reputation were real. Um, although uncertain about their value, um, the employers felt that these benefits were at least equal to tangible financial benefits. So we applied the assumption that the intangible financial benefits were equal to tangible financial benefits so we found that uh, for every dollar invested in occupational health and safety, the estimated average return was 
Um, for 289 manufacturing employers, it was $1.24. For 56 transportation employers, it was $2.14 and $1.34 for 88 construction employers. I'll turn to Cam to talk about the methods. Thank you, Bishak. Could I have the next slide, please? All right. Well, in the next series of slides, I'm gonna, I will outline the methods we use to estimate the financial return on health and safety expenditures among a sample of Ontario employers in three sectors, manufacturing, construction, and transportation. We, we like to think that these methods are transparent. We'll find out if as we describe to you what we've done, if you actually think they're transparent. But here goes. Uh, so we had three phases in the work plan. The first phase, we spoke with the chief actuary of the WSIB to get an accurate estimate of the average direct cost of a lost time workers' compensation claim. This is one of the components of what we call potentially tangible financial benefits. If you prevent a work-related injury that results in a lost time claim, what's the value of that? from the perspective of a prevented cost. The value that he recommended was $40,000 for a lost time claim. In the second phase, we made use of WSIB administrative records to identify larger employers that had low incidence of work-related injury and illness. And we defined low incidence as an incident rate 60% lower than the average incident in that firm's rate group. So these are our high performing employers. And we focused on three sectors, manufacturing, construction, and transportation. So large employers with an incident rate 60% lower than the average in their firm's rate group. And then in the third phase, we applied a set of assumptions to estimate the potential financial benefits of health and safety expenditures in this sample of employers. All right, stay with me as we go on. Can I have the next slide please? All right, so I'm gonna give you a summary of the assumptions we applied. And then in the following slides, we'll illustrate some examples of how these calculations unfold. So in the first step, we used the average health and safety expenditure estimated from the previous study to assign this average expenditure value to each of the, each of the employers in, this, in the current study that had strong occupational health and safety performance. Our original intention was to gather expenditure estimates for each individual employer directly, but we learned that this was simply not feasible given the disruptions caused by the pandemic. In the second step, we estimated the annual number of lost time claims prevented by the firm's strong OHS performance. And we assigned a financial value to these prevented claims, prevented injuries, representing the costs that were averted. We call these tangible financial benefits. And in a moment, we'll illustrate this calculation. And in the third step, we introduced the novel feature of our methods. As, as Bishak outlined, we heard from employers that they believed their strong health and safety performance resulted in intangible benefits in the form of improved employee retention and satisfaction, stronger production quality, and strengthened corporate reputation. They told us that these things were real, that they were the consequence of strong health and safety performance. Employers also though, told us they were uncertain about how to assign a financial value to these benefits that were, in the language of accounting, intangible. But they did tell us they were real. So in consultation with a number of employers, we heard that, that valuing the intangibles as approximately equal to the tangibles sounded sensible to them. So we applied this assumption in our work, and I hope you're still with me as we go through this. And then the final step, which is quite simple, we add the tangible and the intangible financial benefits, divide by the expenditures to estimate the financial return. Go to the next slide. Okay, so just by way of foundation, 
here we're drawing health and safety expenditure estimates from the previous study for the three sectors that were focused on in this, in this study. So the average expenditure per worker per year in manufacturing is about $1,500 based on the information from the 50 employers who spoke to us in the previous study. In the construction sector, the average expenditure per worker per year is approximately two times higher, $3,600. And in the transportation sector, expenditures per worker per year were about $1,300, essentially similar to manufacturing. Can I have the next slide? Okay, here's how we estimated the number of lost time firms, claims, sorry, prevented by a firm a firm with strong health and safety performance. So this is an example of a single employer with 380 employees, manufacturing employer. First row of the table is a count of the number of employees over a six year period. The second row of the table, we've inserted the lost time claim rate for this firm's rate group for the same six years, 2013 to 2018. In the third row of the table, we multiply the incident rate in the second row, stay with me, by the number of employees in the first row. And the result is a count of lost time claims that would be expected if the firm had an incident rate equivalent to the average of the rate group. So over the six year period, the expected number of lost time claims would be 29. In the fourth row, we've tabulated the actual or the observed lost time claims experienced by this employer. And over the six year period, the observed count is 10. So that's, that's an example of comparatively strong health and safety performance by this employer relative to their rate group. The difference between the expected count of 29 and the observed count, which is 10, the difference is 19, you divide by six years, this, this, this firm prevented about three lost time claims per year. And by completing the calculations around what that represents by way of a financial benefit and expressing that per worker per year, the estimate here is almost $1,000 per worker per year of tangible financial benefit. Go to the next slide. So continuing the, exa the, the example of a single manufacturer manufacturing employer with 380 employees. This table brings the estimates together. In this case, this employer chose to calculate their OHS expenditures directly. And the, the number they came up with working with us was about $1,900 per worker year, per worker per year, a little bit higher than the average for the Ontario manufacturing sector of $1,500. On the financial benefits, the tangible benefit estimate is $970, and we sum it with an estimate of intangible financial benefits. Just to remind you, that's, that's the value of improved employee retention, stronger production quality, strengthened corporate reputation, arising from strong OHS performance. And this particular employer said, mm, I think the intangibles are actually worth more than the tangibles, so slightly more than equivalent. Add the two together, the total financial benefits of $2,100, you divide it by the OHS expenditures of $1,900, yields a positive but moderate return for this employer of $1.10 for every dollar spent on health and safety. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, so making, making the journey from a single employer now to the sample of 289 large manufacturing employers, all who have had strong health and safety performance. If you can sort of picture this image, what we're distributing on the horizontal axis is the ROI. So about 60% of employers have an ROI greater than one, ranging from 50 employers with an ROI in the range of one to 1 1.2 to 24 employers, with an ROI greater than two. So this is the distributional characteristic and some employers, 40% of employers have an ROI less than one. Can I have the next slide? So here's the construction employers that we 
are describing, 89 large construction employers with strong health and safety performance. The average OHS expenditure in this sector, remember, is about double the expenditure in the manufacturing sector. 82% of these construction sector employers using our, applying our assumptions, have an ROI greater than one. Hope this has been clear. I'm going to turn it over to Bishak to talk about some conclusions. So to summarize our findings, thank you, Cam. Um, again, applying the assumption that intangible benefits were equal to the value of tangible benefits, uh, we found that the return of investment um, was positive and moderate, ranging between 1.24 to $2.14 for each dollar invested in occupational health and safety. And of course, there was variation around these average return on investment values. Uh, while, while 130 employers, approximately 32% of our sample had an estimated return on investment less than $1, um, 295, close to 70% of the sample had a return on investment uh, estimate greater than $1. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, um, there are a number of limitations to consider in our study. So the first, the first one is the benefit to expenditure ratios calculated um, for large Ontario employers with leading practices in occupational health and safety may not be generalizable to all employers. Um, it's important to note that um, a summary measure of the return of, on investment based on an average ratio of benefits and expenditure across a sample of employers is not necessarily the benefit to expenditure ratio experienced by an individual employer. So an individual employer's financial return on prevention expenditures will vary as a function of the, their own scale of expenditures on occupational health and safety, the frequency of work-related injury and illness compared to the incidence in employer's rate group, and also the financial value that each employer assigns to intangible financial benefits. So more precision, precision would be achieved with individual employer estimates of occupational health and safety expenditures. Um, the study methods also do not provide insight into the typical time interval required for health and safety expenditures to result in consistent improvements in occupational health and safety outcomes. So this is the case both for tangible and intangible benefits that employers realize over time. And finally, although the assumptions we applied in the study are way to be conservative, the methods applied have the potential for measurement error, both in estimating the firm level expenditures and investments and in estimating the direct and indirect costs of work-related injury and illness. Can I have the next slide, please? So to conclude, um, overall, we applied a rigorous and, and a transparent methodology to develop estimates of the financial return to employers arising from their expenditures and investment in occupational health and safety. And consistent with the previous research that we outlined um, in our presentation, our study showed positive financial return on investment expenditures for a sample of large Ontario employers with strong health and safety performance. And these estimates were moderate in the range of $1.24 to $2.14 for each $1 invested in health and safety. And overall, these estimates are consistent with the range of estimates available from research in this field over the past decade. So I'll stop there, thank you. And we'd be very happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. We do have a number of questions, um, but let me start with one um, so that the, the findings suggest that employers you spoke to uh, believe that um, intangible financial benefits are real. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about who um, these employers were in terms of who you spoke to within an organization and what did they say to you? What were examples of the kinds of things that they said to you and either Cam or Bashak? Uh, thanks, Monique. This, this really was perhaps one of the more informative parts of this work. Um, so I think I'd set it up this way. As, as we worked with or consulted with an individual employer, 
we outlined our premise that there may be value in these intangible benefits, uh, employee morale, improved production quality, corporate reputation. We just raised that as a hypothesis, a possibility. And of the employers we spoke to, and I'll give you a framing of how we had these conversations, we invited the person most responsible for health and safety to join with a member of the organization's financial leadership and the organization's human resource leadership. So three people. And, and we invited a conversation about, given your strong health and safety performance, and employers would generally nod their head and go, yeah, we know, we know we're doing a good job. What about the intangible value of that? And absolutely everybody said, oh yeah, that's real. It's real. Often people, often the, the conversation was the most important part about it is employee morale, retention, and satisfaction. And from that comes production quality and corporate reputation. Some of them said that, but they all said it was real that we talked to. Then we asked the question, what do you think it's worth? And that's when everybody went quiet because it's intangible. You can't, you can't do it. Some people had some ideas about how you could do it, parts of it, but the room would go quiet until the financial officer would say something. That typically was the way the conversation resumed, where he or she would say, well, I tell you, it's at least worth the same as these tangible financial benefits that we're seeing. Okay, so we, we didn't canvas the universe of all employers in Ontario. Unfortunately, COVID really got in the way of our ability to have these conversations. But from my perspective, I think Bashak agrees, would agree, the way in which the employer representatives were absolutely emphatic that these intangible things were real and perhaps deserve to be given some degree of value uh, was, how would I describe it? Was a real kind of, I shouldn't call it a discovery, but it was an important observation from this work. Okay, uh, we have a large number of questions. So I just wanted to say to those um, who are asking questions, thank you very much, keep them coming. But if we don't get to all of them, please do feel free to reach out to um, Cam and Bashak uh, directly. Um, and I will move on now to um, another couple of questions that were, were similar. Um, you noted um, that COVID got in the way of some of the reaching out to all employers. Um, so you focused on manufacturing, construction, and I think transportation. And so um, there are a couple of questions about um, pub the public sector in Ontario, healthcare, education. Um, it looks like you weren't able to include them. Can you discuss a little bit why not? And if you have any insights um, into whether those sectors would be similar or different to what you did? Yeah. Well, you can, I think you can easily, all of us participating in this conversation this morning can appreciate just how demanding, difficult, challenging, working in the essential service sector of healthcare and in education ha had been over the two and a half years of the COVID pandemic. Um, so it, yeah, unfortunately the public's, those large public sectors delivering important services, we weren't able to work with on this. Would I think the same thing? I would. I would, I think, I think we would very much expect to see the same profile um, just by the way expend, uh, health and safety expenditures in the publicly funded healthcare system were touching $1,000 per worker per year. The, the education sector, it's about $800 per worker per year. And certainly in the course of the COVID pandemic, we saw just how difficult working conditions during the pandemic were in those sectors. And we fully understand that employers with the support of workers were spending, the expenditures went up during the, during the, during the pandemic. And Bishak, feel free to add in at any point. Well, yes, you were right. I think um, during our study, when we started connecting with the employers, it was 
it was the, the pandemic, it was in 2012, so right at the beginning. And um, most of the employers were just so busy. Everyone was in a bit of a crisis mode. So, um, you know, the ones that we were able to speak to, we really appreciated their time, but I think that really impacted the way that um, we were able to have conversations around that, especially in the healthcare sector. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, someone has asked about um, slide 12, your lost time claims, and comments that there are two ways of reducing WSIB lost time claims. You can reduce the number of accidents, or you can engage in claims management so that accidents don't become lost time claims. And so they um, are interested in how you controlled for the effect of health and safety expenditure versus the effect of claims management on the range of lost time claims? A complex question. I um, don't have some thoughts. It is. <laughs> it is. And I, I think, to be frank, we didn't attempt any accommodation. Sorry, it's the wrong word. We didn't attempt any adjustment for the possibility that, for example, an employer may have been particularly committed to accommodating workers who experience work-related injury and illness such that what for one employer might have been a lost time claim for another employer would have been a no lost time claim. We didn't make any adjustment for that. That's a, that's potentially a limitation that as you consider this work, you wanna keep your eye on. Okay. Um, recognizing some of the limitations that you offered at the end, would you expect employers in the US to have similar average ROIs or are the regulatory healthcare systems just too different to uh, make those comparisons? Man, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I, I that's a very, that's a good question. Uh, no, we did refer to a piece of work that was done about a decade ago based on 400 US employers. Um, I would think so. I would think so, Bishak. Yes, and, and in that work actually, we reported to you the median values. So this was done with uh, 400 employers of large and medium employers. And there was a very big range in terms of the financial decision makers estimates in terms of this ratio. There were some large employers, for example, who said that it would be four to one ratio. Um, so, but about the median is, is two to one. So I think we would, you know, although there are, because I think some, some of the previous research basically just ask the employer representatives about their own estimates of what this ratio would be. <clears throat> you know, as Cam mentioned, you know, people think that there's definitely a real benefit, but it is more of an, a, an individual estimate. So, um, but we would, we would expect it to be the same because I think overall um, from previous research, we see that the estimated benefit is, is at least one to two, two to one, um, if not more. So we used a bit, we, I think our estimates were conservative in that sense. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of uh, people are interested in the uh, companies who were at the lower end of the uh, long-term injury performance groups and whether or not you think that, um, whether or not you could talk about those low performing organizations and whether or not they might have different um, ideas about intangible value. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to tell the story this way. I, it's, it's, it's a case study, um, but it might be a good one. So one of the, the employers that, that we did have the opportunity to speak to told us the story that mm, about six or seven or eight years ago, they really understood that they were not performing well enough, both in terms of production quality, but also in terms of the health and safety of their workers. So there was a, an organizational recognition that they needed to start to step up and they made some pretty substantial investments, some of it around production quality, but interesting to see the story unfold about how tripping hazards were removed and how material handling was tidied up. And sort of the whole thing about the organization became better 
from the perspective of health and safety. That, that employer moved from probably about the middle of their rate group towards the top end of their rate group. And it didn't happen overnight. It took five or six years. But by the time that transition was complete, you know, we heard Bashak, both the, the health and safety director, the financial manager, and the HR person say, all of these changes brought us to where we are now. So the question is a good one, which is if we were to speak to a firm that was below, that had an incident rate of compensation claims that was higher than the average, what would they say about the intangible financial benefits? I don't know, but I don't think they'd rate them as highly personally as a firm that had made an effort to improve from where they were to where they are now. A number of people are interested in whether or not you have upcoming plans to kind of look at different sectors or, or look more fully at some of the low performing organizations. Is, is that uh, in the grant budget or is there a possibility for that? I, you know, I think if we get encouragement from, for example, people on this call that that would be useful to do, I think we'd be eager to do it. Okay. Um, some questions about the, the different folks that you spoke to and whether or not you think there might be bias that's introduced, either because they, they want to be perceived in a certain way or, or they're answering with other folks and they want to, um, you know, so, um, they want to suggest uh, that, um, you know, there, there are benefits and not say that there are no benefits, for example, in speaking in front of the health and safety folks. Well, I, th I mean, I, th I think that that risk is, is present. I also think that the conversations that we did have, people were pretty frank and, and, and you know, they, yeah, they were. They were pretty frank about, mm, that doesn't seem like that's really possible. That seems like it's a pretty high number. I mean, the discussions were pretty frank but i i think you know it's possible that the that the um that the values that we're expressing here have been inflated by uh by that preference to be positive it's possible it's possible okay. we 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 do think as bashak said we do think our estimates are conservative so mm -hmm. we we did we did our best not to not to use a, a method that would produce values that seemed to us like they were too high because they had some of these biases. Yeah, and just to um, just to add to that, so the the <clears throat> ACE study that we referred to earlier on um, that was done with over three hundred employers in the European Union. Um, when they were in their estimates of the ratio of benefits to expenditures, they used a similar methodology of an interview uh, where they brought together representatives of the organizations and, and they are also providing similar estimates. So uh, we, can, we can say that you know, in, a, in a completely different context, these conversations also produce similar, similar estimates. Yeah. yeah, good point. Okay. Um, Someone is interested in whether or not uh, you found or you think there would be a threshold where there would be a diminishing return on health and safety expenditure. Hmm. Hmm. I suppose, I suppose, I don't know where it is. Um, it's not something you found at this point, though. No, no. Yeah, I, I can remember in the context, uh, is this relevant? Well, in the context of the first study, the, the work where we asked Ontario employers to help us estimate what they spent on health and safety, um, the sector that had the highest expenditure was uh, mining, most of it underground in Ontario. 
And I can remember speaking to a table of um, health and safety managers and directors in the mining industry one day, this is before the pandemic, one day just sort of describing that first study. And before I got to what we what we found, I did just ask the room, these are all people quite familiar with the challenges and the hazards in the mining sector. I did just ask the room, what do you think might be the expenditure in the Ontario mining industry per worker per year on health and safety? And the room looked quiet for a while. And then one guy said, I know the answer. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, uh, in my organization, it's $5,000 a worker a year. It's exactly what our work reported. Now, so he told me his number before I put the number on the table from the work we had done. So is that... Is it possible that you could spend too much or that there's diminishing returns? I mean, I, yes, of, of course. Where is that? Mm. I think it's, it's really not possible for us to say. Um, but I do think that these average expenditures that we were able to obtain from Ontario employers before the pandemic are in a sense a useful benchmark. So for each sector, there's an average expenditure. I think an employer in the sector could ask the question, are we at the benchmark? Are we above the benchmark? Do we know if we are, why we're above the benchmark? And an employer that's not at the benchmark probably could have a conversation internally about, hmm, maybe we should think about moving towards the benchmark. So those, those numbers, those estimates are pre-pandemic. Um, are they still right now? Probably not. How's that, that for an answer? That's good, except it, and it leads perfectly into the next question. Uh, we have a number of people who are wondering whether or not you would anticipate, I know you haven't done the study, but what, what you think might have changed or remained the same with COVID. So do you think you'd get the similar findings now that you did pre-COVID? Hmm. I, I think we would get higher expenditures, especially yeah. in some sectors. Yeah. Hmm. And, you know, difficult, difficult, if not impossible to estimate what the return on that investment would be in terms of infections pre prevented because of strong infection prevention and control practices in workplaces. You know, for the, so many workplaces in essential service put so much effort into reducing the risk of transmission at work that we'll never know really, I think, how many infections were prevented among essential service workers because of these expenditures. I, I don't think we'll ever know. Um, but there are a number of essential service sectors in Ontario that had an infection, a workplace outbreak infection rate that was below the rate of infection in the community, if you got what I'm saying. So spending eight hours a day at work with coworkers where infection prevention and control was adequate was safer than being in the community, if you got what I'm saying. But we'll never know what the scale of the benefit is, I don't think. Do you have um, opportunities for longitudinal studies going forward in the future? Uh, we'd love to, we'd love to. <laughs> I say that for anyone listening who has funding available, that uh, we're, we have certainly interest among the listeners in, in those that, that topic. Um, Kamen Bashak, if the reported return on investments were averages, was there one or more variables that really helped distinguish those companies with the higher return on investment versus mm -hmm. the lower return on investment? Uh, are you able to point to anything, credentials of OHS representatives, uh, whether they were managers or worker level um, people? Um, any thoughts there? 
That's a great question. That's a good question. That, that is a great question. And uh, at this moment, in this conversation, we don't have an answer uh, that would be satisfactory, but that is a great question. And you, know, you can think of a whole range of things that might be relevant here. Um, but thank, thank you for that question. That's something, Bashak, we can take away and, and look for look for insights. Okay. Um, another question, and I am conscious of the time, and but we're we're moving through the questions again. If people uh, don't get their question answered, please do reach out to Cam and Bashak. Um, but um, a question here about. Um, issues, outcomes like improved morale and reduction in turnover um, being not always attributed to OHS only. Um, and so were you able to look at some other factors? Um, if you weren't, would if you were to do it all over again, would there be certain factors you would look at? Yeah, that's a really good point that um, improved or a strengthened corporate reputation doesn't arise only from strong health and safety performance. It arises from the quality of the production and the work that is done. Um, employee morale, um, retention, satisfaction doesn't just arise from health and safety performance. It arises from all sorts of things, including what's the compensation like compared to the benchmarks in the industry. Um, what are the health and safety, sorry, what are the human resource practices around promotion and career development? Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, yeah, and we hope we haven't overvalued it, but go ahead, Bishak. Um, that, that is a really good question. And I think um, I remember in one of the conversations that we had um, with an employer. Um, so when they were thinking about the, the intangible benefits and the value attributed to it and the way that you know they would quantify it or think about it. Um, I remember a human resource professional talking about, um, you know, we can think about um, lower turnover. And then they talked about actually doing staff surveys where this is a general job satisfaction, employee satisfaction survey that had questions, of course, not only related to health and safety, but larger. But I think the the, 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 the conversation was that investing in health and safety was definitely a factor in, in, in that, in getting like, for example, higher um, satisfaction scores in, in, in that employee survey that they routine, routinely implement in their workplace. So um, definitely, and, and this is, I think, what is fascinating that I would love to unpack more and hopefully maybe we will in the future is that understanding of um, how health and safety is completely integrated with, with the human resources and, and other factors within the, within the organization in terms of things that lead to higher satisfaction, corporate reputation and, and all of it. But I think there was a sense that of course, it's not just health and safety, but investing in health, health and safety creates an environment where workers feel valued and, and safe. Um, so I, I would say that Okay, um, we have um, a question that um, is asking about uh, differences in Quebec versus on, in Ontario and wondering about possible collaboration. Um, so in Quebec, there's a requirement for documenting training expenditures of which a large part are for health and safety. Would you be able to use those actual numbers by firm to estimate expenditures and financial benefits um, uh, for this group? And is this some uh, a line of inquiry where perhaps the Institute for Work and Health and the IRSST, which is the Quebec um, Sister Institute for Work and Health, um, to explore further? That's a great idea. Thank you very much. Let's stay in touch. That's a great okay. idea. <laughs> All right, I'm just looking through here because uh, I, I know we, we don't have a lot of time left, just looking for, um, so uh, just to make, so first of all, uh, lots of interest in the talk. I wanna thank you and um, lots of interest in repeating the, the research with different groups, particularly I think some of the public service, healthcare, education, occupational uh, medicine physicians. Um, and so I just wanted to, um, 
comment about that. Um, and uh, yeah, so lots of different sectors. Um, and so let me just uh, go up here. And um, someone is uh, just interested uh, before you go in um, having you uh, repeat or, or further elaborate on how the cost of an injury is calculated. Right, good question. Okay, so um, there's two components. The, the direct cost as we called it, was the WSIB's average expenditure to administer benefits for a lost time claim. The second component we call indirect costs. So this is an estimate of what costs arise in a firm to respond to the consequences of uh, disabling work-related injury or illness. So the cost of recruiting somebody to replace the person who's been who's disabled, uh, the costs of work disruption. Uh, and we value that at twice the direct cost, twice the $40,000. We think that's conservative. Uh, I can recall one employer said to us, mm, that indirect is four times. Right. If we have a disabling work-related injury, as a manufacturer, uh, we're four times what the compensation cost is to essentially put things back together after that. So I hope that's helpful, and hopefully that information is clearly presented in the um, in the article that's available out on the web if you want to have a look at it. Okay, uh, was there a sort of a happy threshold for money uh, um, invested uh, for any particular sector? And, and do you think it differs those perceptions between workers and employers about how, how much would be a, the, you know, at least this much? Mm. On the expenditure side, I mean, I, I think I, I was struck by how, this is gonna get a little statistical, but go with me on this. This is the first study, what do employers spend on health and safety. What are their health and safety expenditures? I, I think I was struck by how generally similar the estimates were within a sector. So for lack of a better word, the standard deviation wasn't really wide. Uh, it wasn't like one employer spent $300 per worker per year and another employer spent $3,000 a worker a year in the same sector. So this the sector estimates seem relatively precise in terms of, mm, that's kind of a, a reasonable representation of what the average is. Whether it's the right amount is a different question, right? And there are some sectors in the, in the service side of the world where, you know, I mean, between you and me, I, I, I would say you might wanna think about looking at your expenditures because maybe you're not quite at the right level to address the nature of the hazards in that sector, maybe. Okay, um, I think we unfortunately only have time for one more question. So apologies that we didn't get through all of them. Uh, but um, someone has noted that a number of years ago, um, IWH did a study, um, and Neil Tompa, I think was um, the PI in this work, showing that financial pen penalties led to OHS change. Um, was that something that you considered um, for this research or accounted for in the study? No, so the, the work that is being referred to was some, I think, important work that Emil Tampa did reviewing the research literature on the effectiveness of occupational health and safety regulation and enforcement, right? And it was one of the conclusions from that work, looking at research published from pretty much North America, probably some European studies, that firms that incurred a financial penalty as a consequence of um, poor health and safety performance on the part of the regulator, that there was generally a response that led to an improvement over time. We didn't factor that into our work. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. 
Well, I want to thank you very much. I think that's all the time we have today. That was a fascinating presentation. And again, I hope uh, people will reach out to Cam and Bashak um, to learn more about the, the research um, and uh, to ask any questions that you may still have. And I hope you'll be able to join us next month on March 21st, um, when um, I will be giving a presentation um, that is titled The Unveiling of the JDAPT, a new interactive tool to identify work-related support strategies for workers with chronic conditions and disabilities. So once again, thank you so very much, Cam and Bashak. That was a, a fabulous presentation. Thank Have you. a great day, everybody.